Good evening. It's good to have you with us again for some Biblical Insights with Bob. Tonight we're looking at uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. We've talked about the Lord's Prayer. We've uh, looked at some other passages on the sermon. So tonight we're looking at chapter 7, which kind of concludes that sermon. Greatest uh, passage in Matthew, I think. So let's, uh, let's begin. And uh, let's take verse 1 now. It starts out, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. King James, judge not that ye be not judged. Now, we need to realize that this is not telling us not to not to see things in others that need to be determined, but it's telling us not to criticize and not to let them know our judgments. Uh, I like what the translation the message says let me read that for you it says don't pick on people don't jump on their failures criticize their faults unless of course uh, you want the same treatment critical spirit has a way of boomerang so when Jesus said in the sermon do not judge he's not saying don't evaluate he's saying don't be critical don't judge. It's so easy to make up our mind about something and then determine the way we're going to handle that. We're going to let that person know it or we're going to leave them alone. We're going to cross them off our list. All kinds of things that we determine because we judge them. But Jesus said, don't judge so that you won't be judged. You see, the follower of Christ who takes it on himself to be the judge of another person really takes the place of God. He usurps that power of judgment. And so don't assume that place. You don't have the right to stand in that position. So let's go on and look at verses uh, 2 through 5, which, which continues the thought. I just started with verse number one, Jesus says, in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it'll be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and let, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So, according to the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, God has two measures, mercy and justice. The commandment not to judge is not a command to be blind, but it's a command to be merciful. The judgment is his, the mercy we need to imitate in his. How can we help but judging? The power of seeing something in a person's character or activity uh, is something we should cultivate. To not be able to do that makes us simpletons. But seeing into con the character and the person is not what Jesus is condemning here. The judging he's talking about, seeing the moat in our brother's eye and then trying to remove it, but all the time we got a log. I think that's, uh, uh, that's part of Jesus' sense of humor. One of the, uh, I used to have a book, The Humor of Christ title, and uh, this was one of the places where the author said Jesus was using humor to make a point. You look for the speck in your brother's eye, but all the time your eye is cluttered with all this junk. So verse 6. Don't give what is holy to the dogs, and don't throw your pearls before the swine, 
or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What he's saying is there's, there's times when it's better just to keep our mouth shut, just not to say anything. One of the commentators I like uh, to read tells a story about a uh, Tennessee legislator friend of his who uh, had been a heavy drinker, but he was wonderfully converted and today is a very strong Christian. Now, other members of the legislator knew that he drank. So one day they, they heard that he, quote, got religion, and they, as they called it. So one day, one of the fellows of the legislator said to him, Preacher, why don't you give us a sermon today? And then he said, I'm sorry. I don't have anything to say. My Lord told me not to cast my pearls before the swine. And he sat down, and they never ridiculed him again. So sometimes it's better not to say anything. Sometimes people just can't see the truth. As I read this and thought about it, the thought came to me, I wonder, some of the stuff we put on Facebook is casting pearls before the swine. Do we need to be a little more careful about what we say and who we say it to? That's what Jesus said. He said, they'll trample them or they'll turn and tear you to pieces. I have some strong thoughts on that. Too many times we'd be better just to. I'm not saying we should be cowards and not be willing to speak out when the time is right, but sometimes we're better off speaking through our behavior, our love, our charity. So let's look at verse number seven. Actually, 7 through 11. Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he won't give him a serpent, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? A couple things I see in this verse. Number one, there are three commands here, not one. Ask, seek, and knock. And it, it kind of is like it, it goes a step at a time. Start by asking, seeking, and then knocking. So it's repeated in the present tense. In other words, it could be phrased this way. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. <clears throat> So it's in the imperfect tense in the Greek, which means uh, to keep on doing it, just continue doing it. So we, we see there it's, it's not just a matter of voicing our request one time. It's a matter of persisting in prayer. Uh, it's three imperatives, ask, which is simply praying, asking for one who has the power to give, but keep on asking, and then seeking. Now, seeking carries with it a sense of looking, a sense of uh, digging a little deeper, a sense of understanding more, uh, getting to the bottom of things, and then knocking, 
is persisting. Remember the story Jesus told about the woman who knocked at a man's door and asked for bread. She had guests come in. And because she kept on knocking and asking, the man finally gave her. So it's a matter of persistence. Far too often, Christians don't have this ability or don't have this persistence because they ask, or maybe they ask with selfish motives. Jesus' disciples will ask with earnest sincerity, seek with active, diligent pursuit, and knock. I like verse number 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to them what is good to those who ask him? I was separated from my father from the time I was about four and a half years old until I was in my 40s. We had, I had not spoken to him. <clears throat> I just kind of lost him. I went to California on a visit or a ministry trip and tried to find him, but he had moved and I couldn't find him. A couple weeks later, I found out that he was in my hometown and I got in touch with him. We were able that weekend to, to be with him. One of the things I noticed about him, he was my father. He was looking around that motor home trying to find something to give. Something about a father wants to give to his children. He gave me a book. But there's a, there's a characteristic of a good father whose desire is to meet the needs to father. And so Jesus says of us, if we being evil, and I don't think he means being wicked, I think he means being human, uh, being less than God, being with faults, if we know how to give good gifts, how much more? So let's pray, let's ask, let's seek, let's knock. Remember he says, whatever we ask in his name, according to his will, according to his purpose, he'll give. A powerful statement there. Now let's look at verse 12. Now we, we know this verse 12, we call it the golden rule. In everything therefore, you know, it's the word therefore, in everything therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the law and the prophets. It's kind of interesting. What Jesus is saying, this is the whole uh, the whole teaching of, of, of the Word of God. This is the whole teaching of the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. Interestingly enough, in verse, in chapter 5, in the very first part, Jesus said, the beginning of the sermon, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish or destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And now he's saying at the end of the sermon, this is the law Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. I like that. Now, nowhere in the Old Testament does it say this, but it just kind of sums up everything that is taught in the Old Testament. Therefore, instead of judging others, instead of saying things that they're not ready to hear, we should treat them as we ourselves want to be treated. Remember Jesus told us the greatest commandment was to love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and the second was like it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Here it is. If we do that, we'll treat them like we want to be treated. 
So that's the golden rule. This is the second reference in the sermon to the law and the prophets. In the last part of this tra chapter, verses 13 through 27, we have four warnings. Each warning is a contrast between two things. Verse 13, 14, the two ways. 15 through 20, two trees. 21 to 23, two claims. And finally, we're all familiar with the two builders. So let's look at them. Verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Picture's clear enough. There's two gates, two roads, two crowds, two destinations. The narrow gate, and the King James says straight, which means uh, narrow or, or difficult to get through. The wide gate seems much more inviting. Two different words are used for narrow. One of them means narrow, as we think of narrow, but the other means the word is thlipsis in Greek, which means difficult uh, persecution, difficult times. Uh, in other words, if you enter that gate, it's not going to be easy. You're going to suffer some persecution. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you, remember? But it leads to where it leads is all important. It leads to life, eternal life. On the other hand, you have the Broadway. Everybody's going that way. It's popular. It's, everybody's doing it. But it leads to destruction. We have that choice. It's a warning to us. Choose the straight way, the narrow way. The second choice in verses 15 through 20. Beware of the false prophets, he says, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are as ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes, are they? Nor figs from thistles. So every good tree bears good fruit but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you will know them by their fruits. Now we know that this is based on the fact that not everybody who comes professing to teach the Word of God, the Law and the Prophets, if you will, is telling the truth. You can't always tell a person by their words, but you can always tell a person by their fruits, by what they produce. So, with people, you can't... You can tell what a bush is bearing. If you go to a bush that bears poisonous fruit, they may look good, but we know that if you eat it, you'll be poisoned. You know them by their fruits. Not what one says or even what one does. But everything one says and does will ultimately real, reveal what one is. Living according to the kingdom norms, 
You can play it for a while. You can act like it for a while. You can say the right thing. You can do the right, what appears to be the right thing. But ultimately, people are going to see us by our fruits. Remember Jesus said, I'm sorry, Paul said, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. They'll know us by who we are, not by what we say, not even always by what we do. They'll know us, the two trees, the two ways, and thirdly, the two claims, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he, again, who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So we're really talking about the same false prophets here that we talked about in, in the last five verses. They cry, Lord, Lord. But it's their obedience. It's their fruit. Not their titles. Not their positions. Not, oh, I bought said it. Not the size of their churches. Not, not their dinner. It's who they are. It's the truth of who they are. And then finally, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, remember, this is, this is the conclusion. This is the end of the sermon. Not everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house. Yet it didn't fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell. And great was its fall. Again, these four warnings all about the same thing. We got to be real. Contrast the saying and doing, the building, the activities. A wise person represents those who put Jesus' words into practices. And the more I study his words, the more I see how vitally important it is that we don't just talk about them, we don't just pray about them, we put them in practice in our lives. Those who pretend to have faith or those who just make intellectual commitment. Remember John tells us, whosoever believeth on him shall have Everlasting, not just intellectual belief. Belief here uh, means by obeying, following, doing those things he tells us. When the storms of life come, who you are, your structure will fool no one. Above all, not our Creator not our God. And so ends the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus finished his words, the crowds marveled at his teaching. Oh, might we have that same reaction. Not just to pass it over, not just to read it, but to take them to heart and believe them, not just intellectually, but with our heart and soul believe in what he tells us. Build our house on the rock. 
take the narrow way, bear good fruit. Thank you for joining us. Been good being with you.